everyone, I'm Pam Haskins and I teach literature and composition to middle schoolers. Over my 25 year career, I've taught in a variety of educational settings that include K through 12, rural, urban, suburban, both public and private. So y'all, I've seen a lot. Every day I went into my classroom, I feel like I learned so much from my students and so much of what I learned helped me become a better teacher. I'm passionate about making sure that all of my students leave my classroom better readers than when they walked in. I want to make sure that my students are able to express themselves clearly in writing as well. So I've taken a lot of time to study literacy in our communities. And when I say in our communities, I'm talking about the communities of people that look like me. Because there is an issue in a lot of the communities where black and brown students don't read as well as their white counterparts. And I've often wondered why it's not for a lack of intelligence. It's not for a lack of trying, but what is it? Is it something deeper? Research says that students who come from print rich homes will be good readers. Research also says that students who have college educated parents will be good readers. Another research fact reveals kindergarten, pre-K, those are the answers to reading success. And while I agree with the research, I also have to disagree because in real life, I've seen students who have college educated parents who have come from print rich homes and who started in Head Start and pre-K and their literacy skills are still not quite up to par. In fact, some of them could not stand to read and that bothered me. I wanted to know why. What's the deeper reading, the, the deeper reason why these students don't read well, nor do they care to dig deep and figure it out. Now, of course, when you drive down the street and you see people who don't have college degrees, nor did their parents, and you know that the homes are not print rich, is that a reason to say, oh, they just aren't capable. Absolutely not. That's a reason to lean in, to dig in even deeper, to figure out the roots of the deficiencies around reading in black and brown communities. I've done some digging and I wanna share with you exactly what I found. Okay, educators, go with me here. Is this scene familiar to you? Out of a class of 30 students, nine of them may be proficient readers. Four of those nine students may be excellent readers, but the others really need one-on-one -on -one attention to ensure literacy success. Does that look like your classroom? It certainly looked like mine, and I felt the pressure every year to sit with each and every child to make sure that each and every deficit was filled, and it's overwhelming. It's exhausting, but it's an enduring issue. Then, just when you think you've dug deep enough, here comes a state test, and you have to pivot and teach to a scope and a sequence which is fine, but you know, little Jamisha over there needs just a little bit of extra care. Our most vulnerable students in this age of the coronavirus are even more vulnerable. If they're not in our classrooms and if their home environments are still lacking instruction via computer or whatever, there is a monumental task for us as educators 
to ensure the complete literacy of a population that was still struggling to reach 50% literacy. We know these students have not had a solid foundation this year. We know these students have not been consistently doing the homework, the classwork, but we're still having to crank out students from our classrooms every year. Where will these babies end up? How do we make sure that our most vulnerable students are not left behind? I'm talking about the populations who are traditionally low and below in reading, behind in achievement, not because they are less capable, oh no, but because there is a system on which they operate on the outskirts of success due to the legacy of American chattel slavery and its historical effects on black and brown students that show up in your classroom and it shows up in my classroom. It's now at the kitchen tables of America's homes and they're hopefully gonna come back to our classrooms, but until then, what do we do for those children? Today, I want to remind everyone of the brutal roots of slavery and its effect on reading in the black and indigenous people of color community, hereby known as BIPOC. So our time today will be in stages. We'll discuss the current condition. After that, we'll look at the root of the problem in detail. And finally, I will suggest some basic strategies on how to fix it. But first, who am I? I was born in rural, segregated Mississippi, in a small town that if you blinked, you'll miss it on the map. And I have warm and fuzzy memories learning to read. My dad and I would ride around town reading the signs of major retailers. He would always hand me the Sunday comics and we'd flip through the pages together at the breakfast table. I would thumb through the hymnals at church. I loved reading the maps we took on road trips. And my favorite thing to read to this day, sheet music. Through music, reading those Italian, and Latin and Spanish words because of my mother's influence, I learned patterns of symbols, letters, numbers, and it was like a game to me because it was fun. I enjoyed reading everything I got my hands on, and I've always been surrounded by words because I grew up in a bookstore, and my favorite place to hang out was the library. When Barnes and Nobles started putting Starbucks in their bookstores, I was in heaven. I was one of two black students in AP classes in my high school, particularly an AP language class. I was one of two and the other black student hated it. I would have hated it too, except that my natural curiosity that was fed through books was even fed more. We read the classics, Ethan Frome, Frankenstein, A Night to Remember. And so I pressed through human monsters, sinking luxury ships and suicidal sleddings. But being a black girl from the deep South in the seventies and eighties who stretched in order to connect with Ethan's weird way of showing love, and analyzing sinking ships metaphorically in a 3,500 word timed essay, all for college credit, no pressure, right? It's just a once in a lifetime opportunity to take high school classes for college credit, which equals cold cash or tuition money. So the stakes were high and I had to lean in. This was my one and only chance to prove my college readiness. I did marginally well on the AP exams and I earned the credit. Cha-ching! But I looked around my small town 
mostly rural agricultural community at large and wondered, if I was one of two students of color in an AP English classroom and I had an independent love for words, I wondered if my schoolmates, who were just as capable at other things, got the same opportunity that I just did. I saw some did, but many did not. You see, I was part of the outlier group, the exception, but the rule, the majority, unfortunately, they were less equipped. Our rural district test scores had yet again hit low numbers being in the deep south. And over the years, test scores lingered near the bottom, adding weight to the sinking test scores of the nation that eventually sank towards the bottom percentiles when compared to the other nation's educational rankings. Almost like the Titanic in A Night to Remember, a reading disaster. The problem was due to the lack of basic literacy and numeracy skills. And I always wondered why. Why is there such low reading scores in the South, mainly in black and brown communities? Why is the disparity so stark? It certainly isn't because black and brown folks were less capable. Oh no, to the contrary. The brilliant people that I chatted with daily are so full of wit and impart so much wisdom. Yet by some standards, these same wise folks were functionally illiterate. Why were there two tracks of students at my high school or at any high school for that matter, college bound and then some not college bound? Would, wouldn't both groups need to be completely literate? Why were the standards higher for one group than for the other? And why do those disparities always follow the millions of native Hispanic and black students in American classrooms, schools, districts, states, regions. The last publication of the NCES, the National Council of Educational Statistics, students of color again are lower than the national average. Why are black and native Hispanic children more likely to be placed in special education or on suspension. These test scores set trends so heavily characteristic that it seemed to define the intelligence of a group of people. But I'm here today to dispel a horrible myth that black and brown children are less capable and less deserving of our very best efforts. Despite toys like LeapFrog and the tons of websites and initiatives like Whole Language and endless lists of Dutch sight words, inventive spelling and hooked on phonics, the reading trends are mainly stagnant. Why? To find the answer and to solve the problem, I sought an English degree concentrating on African-American literature and women's studies. Adding an education master's degree, I read books like Other People's Children by Lisa Delpit, The Dream Keepers, Successful Teachers of African American Children by Dr. Gloria Latson Billings. I listened to Kwanzaa Kunjufu talk about educating black boys, and I read Bell Hooks' Teaching to Transgress, all of whom built a case for racism and racial disparities, but it wasn't until it really dawned on me weighed me down like a ton of bricks was the idea that reading was illegal for black and brown people for over 400 years. Illegal, flat out against the law with real consequences to pay. Some consequences were monetary, especially if you were of the landowning class. Other consequences were physical and mental, and those seeped into our psyche. As a teacher and a mama, panic set in because as I looked around my community, my school district, the system, the city, the state, the region, the nation, I saw evidence of 
all of our reading disparities coming from the very same root. I've been afforded the luxury of international travel and have been able to see for myself the collision of history and current events. I visited communities and schools around the Americas, Africa, Asia, and Europe, and this route has been confirmed. Those who don't know their history are doomed to repeat it. I realized that to understand the future, that I must understand the past. I'd like to introduce you to a symbol that communicates the idea of looking back in order to move forward. It is the Sankofa symbol from a collection of symbols called Adinkra symbols from Ghana in West Africa. It means that one must value historical fact in order to correct the course of the future, which is why the bird's body is facing forward, but its head is turned backwards. In most renderings, there is an egg on the bird's back representing the future. The Sankofa is part of a collection of over 120 symbols created in the 1800s. So for the purpose of this conversation, Let's apply the concept of Sankofa and delve into a past that is both painful and insightful. We must first, though, consider our current situation. The U.S. Department of Education publishes statistics that give a general overview of our achievement. And I love to see how they break the data down. Here are some startling numbers that illustrate what I've seen in my classrooms in urban, suburban, and rural environments, both private and public. 18% of eighth graders were proficient readers. 17% of 12th graders were proficient readers. This slide shows stats for Hispanic and native populations who are English language learners. You see more black and brown students in higher percentages being served in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. The percentage of students served under IDEA was highest for American Indian, Alaska Native students at 18% black students at 16%, Hispanic students at 13%. Add those up, there's your BIPOC community. Whereas white students and students of two or more races came in vastly underneath. This slide affirms that black and brown students fall behind their white counterparts routinely. These statistics show low numbers of black and brown students enrolled in advanced placement courses. This next one shows the ability of students reading prose, documents, and quantitative texts effectively. And it's clear to see that black and brown students again are lagging behind. This infographic made this story more clear for me. I knew it in my gut, but to see it plain and simple, the states, which happen to be slave states, have the lowest literacy rates among adults. I was like, duh, but we can't stop there. There's so much more to discover to this route. Y'all, if we're really honest, and stop to think about current literacy rates and how terribly low they are. We think this is a travesty, of course, right? Wrong. Let me explain further. When compared to the past, 
these statistics that we see today are actually a wonderful victory because for over 200 years, the literacy rates amongst the enslaved, newly freed, and descendants of formerly enslaved people was arguably zero. Definitely less than 10%. And I'm being very generous with that. Aside from a small population of college-educated people of color in the Americas, the vast majority of black and brown folks were illiterate. And there were laws written and enforced for centuries to make sure it stayed that way. Let me introduce you to the laws that created mental and physical obstacles intentionally underdeveloping black and brown people. Anti-literacy laws permeated the United States for so long that they have left an impression on black and brown people that we can see palpably today. This primary source proves the fact that it was illegal for enslaved people to read. According to this law, no slave is to teach another to read. If any slave shall teach or attempt to teach any other slave to read or write, the use of figures accepted, he or she may be carried before any justice of the peace and on conviction thereof shall be sentenced to receive 39 lashes on his or her back. Ouch. So historically, the literacy rate for black and brown people is arguably zero. Why? Because there were methods of corporal punishment for breaking this code. Being caught teaching an enslaved person how to read cost the landowner a hefty fine of thousands of dollars in today's standards if caught by another authority figure. However, the enslaved person's physical body and their lives were endangered. Let's take a deeper look at the timeline of events in history to understand where we are today and how deep the problem really is. The history of black and brown people are certainly interconnected. In the 1200s, there were great African empires of Timbuktu, Great Zimbabwe, that were full of universities and libraries. Complete literacy was the law of the land, and this is history that is very seldom revealed to our black and brown students who think that literacy is hopeless. 1492 started a huge turn in human events. It began the period of enslavement and the literacy laws went into effect. At the end of the enslavement period, there were still Jim Crow laws and black codes that further perpetuated a slave state of mind, separate, but so very unequal. The 1900s, saw an uptick in educational opportunities as schools for freed blacks were opened around the nation. And a quick hundred years revealed that we needed to have another law ensuring that no child would be left behind. And the statistics that we started our talk with today have defined the movement of our students towards literacy success. Please notice that the longest part of that timeline is the centuries of active slavery where efforts to educate black and brown people were met with harsh punishment. So harsh that the scars are deeply embedded in the minds of students and adult non-readers today. And they show up in our classrooms every morning. It may be hard for you to fathom this case I'm building, so I want you to check it for yourself. 
The novel Night John is realistic fiction written by Gary Paulson that was inspired by true events. It's a short novel written on a third or sixth grade level, somewhere in there, that dramatizes one of the most traumatic episodes in human history. Readers become acquainted with the system of slavery and how it destroyed family structures, altered psyches, and the psychological health of future generations by following a young girl named Sarni who has a desire to read. And our main character, Night John, wants to help her. The legacy of anti-literacy laws are deep-seated and have permeated our very DNA and it shows up in your classrooms festering as the wound that it is. Just look at the result of physical lashes that enslaved people were dealt when it came to the basic right, the human right of education. Yes, it's tough to look at. Sure, it's tough to digest, but it's the truth. It's tough for us to hear how horrible slavery was, but boy, was it even tougher to live through it. For four centuries, it was tough to live that truth every second of every day that a group of people conspired to deny humanity to another group of people for the sake of a dollar. For an enslaved person to wake up each morning and go to sleep each night knowing that your everyday experience was the American nightmare, not the American dream. Imagine centuries where real people who were told that they were being quote unquote civilized from a quote unquote savage state suffered under a system of enslavement that tore babies from mother's arms, lynched black men and used every ounce of muscle for monetary gain with no payment in return. The reason for this conversation is because a lot of that history has never fully been revealed. Even in our textbooks, it's been sanitized. In order to accomplish lofty goals, such as the American dream in the 1700s, the black man, woman, and child were forbidden to read. So when we look at today's statistics, a fully funded and accessible education has only been legal for formerly enslaved people for a mere 60 years. Within those 60 years, the needs of our black and brown students are still only marginally addressed. Representation is lacking in the literature and in the teaching force, and the legacy of historical trauma still grips our communities and our homes and our classrooms. Yes, your classroom too. In that high school classroom I described earlier, I often wondered why many students made it seem like school was a chore, a dreaded chore at that. But when I read a book by a woman by the name of Dr. Joy DeGruy, I fully recognized how deeply wounding the anti-literacy laws were to our black and brown communities. So from 0% to 32% reading literacy rates, that's a huge success. But it's no wonder that for the last 100 years, reading achievement has been stagnant. It's tough to hear year after year that the history of a people begins with its being conquered. So some students stop trying because they see it as a defeat. And teachers who don't look like them don't recognize the need to push harder for the psychological effects to be reversed. That festering wound that shows up in our classrooms looking like defiance, looking like incapability, is really rooted in history. 
Consider the soldier who sees active military duty. They see carnage, death, destruction. They live in fear each day and night, wondering if they will make it home alive. Even a short tour of duty can be psychologically devastating to our strong, brave soldiers. When they return home, it is necessary for many of them to seek help that is specialized and consistent. And I ask, has this same methodical care been given to formerly enslaved people who endured that same fear of carnage and death day in and day out? Ever been methodically cared for? No, it hasn't. And for those who say, oh, that was so long ago. Why are we still talking about it? Remember the statistics we read earlier? Do you notice what's going on in the streets of America when unarmed black men, women, and children are killed with no regard for their lives or their families' lives? You can't move forward without addressing the past because it's rooted in history. If you don't believe me that historical trauma affects generations, go ask a soldier about their hidden wounds from war. They may look okay, but inside they're raging. The soldiers know why and from whence their rage comes. But because it's been so long ago and because we do not talk about it, our black and brown students have no idea that this rage is boiling inside of them because of historical conditions from so long ago. Research on this topic has been covered by Dr. DeGruy, who calls it post-traumatic slave syndrome. And when you read her book, you will see why. I marvel at how a soldier can return from war and get therapy and treatment, acknowledgement of their PTSD, D, from the horrors of war and carnage, but the descendants of 400 years of enslaved people who are experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder are not afforded the same balm. Y'all, we have a mighty responsibility to recognize historical trauma in our classrooms and find ways to help this community heal. It's deeper than test scores, deeper than scopes and sequences. It's deeper than that. These wounds have harmed folks down to the bone, down to the core, down to their very DNA. And we as educators have an awesome task to build and repair and heal the wounds right in our classrooms. I know y'all are thinking, but we ain't no doctors. We're not therapists, nor are we pathologists. We're not psychologists, nor can we prescribe medicines to make it all go away. But yes, we are. We are all of those things. Teachers are all things to all kids. And if you haven't wiped a runny snotty nose, if you haven't calmed fears, from a child who's crying, if you haven't provided supplies for that child who just doesn't have, or been a respite for the child who's been afraid, I'm wondering, are you fully teaching? If you are not all those things to all kids, maybe another profession is better suited. Because teachers do it all. We make ways out of no way. And this is a task that all of us must lean into. That classroom example I described earlier may have sounded like a typical third or fourth grade level classroom. But y'all, that was a high school classroom and the kids were 17 and 18 years old. They were either going to leave the K-12 environment and go into a college environment and be woefully underprepared 
or they'll go out into the world of work and face similar challenges. Vocations and trades are options and they need to be embraced. And if students are not entrepreneurial or ready to go into the armed forces, those options can be few and far between within the trades because they still require you to have complete literacy. Would you want somebody coming to your home to fix your HVAC system and not know how to read the directions carefully? I didn't think so. So it's important for every student to leave our classrooms 100% literate. History creates reality. And in reality, the connections between school and home has now turned from a triangle into a straight line. And the homes of black and indigenous people have historically been at odds with schools. Let's take a deeper look, shall we? The future depends on what we do today in this CRT generation. Now, what do I mean the CRT generation? These are three letters that have been around the educational scene as an acronym since the 90s when Dr. Gloria Latson Billings coined the term culturally relevant teaching. Then Dr. Zaretta Hammonds joined her by coining the term culturally responsive teaching a few years back. And then we have a third to join the scene called critical race theory. There are so many resources out there of folks who have defined how to do the work effectively. But since May 25th, 2020, when George Floyd became a household phenomenon, have we uncovered and made this acronym a household phenomenon? Educators these days are arming themselves with strategies for the brain, with strategies on how to deal with the law and how to combat microaggressions. But are we really healing the hearts and minds of our children who still do not read because of over years of lawful ignorance? Let's fast forward to 2021, the 21st century. where students have the power of the internet at their fingertips. Literacy rates are in fact improving, but many students are home where there isn't print rich environments. So they miss opportunities to learn standard English, most properly in the lower grades, so that AP classes and IB diplomas are within reach in the higher grades. Working parents do not always have the luxury of spending warm, fuzzy car rides, reading retail signs or maps or sheet music, despite their children's natural intelligence. Many of the students are home without a system of accountability, and that's where educators must forge a stronger relationship with those homes that have experienced trauma in the educational arena historically. In some homes, there are parents who are functionally illiterate, who have influenced their children and or grandchildren along similar trains of thought. Those home behaviors end up in your classroom, in my classroom, and it is our super teacher power to rewire those patterns for good. So what do we do? Here are a few tips that I think are common sense and are the basics. Being hooked on phonics and so many other band-aids that put an aesthetic covering over this festering wound. Educators had students in their classrooms for years and the rates only went up marginally. The attention has marginally been on the 26 letters of the alphabet, but I'm here to tell you, 
that that is not the complete list of phonograms that our students need to learn. There are in fact 76. Yes, I know I blew your mind. Seven, I'm sorry, not 76, 74. Still, there are 74 phonograms that students need to learn in order to be functionally literate. So now in the COVID era, we face that because sometimes the parents need to know those things. Teach all 74, not just the traditional 26. Reading is important all day long, not just in English class. Consider focusing on transition words, Greek and Latin roots, and etymology in not just English class, but in all content areas. In fact, I think all teachers should have a reading endorsement just for that purpose. To conclude, I would like to reiterate my point that black and brown students are traditionally behind their white counterparts in reading, which affects their future success. These students are more than capable of complete literacy and they need to understand more than just the 26 traditional sounds that make up words so that they can begin to erase the effects of anti-literacy laws and PTSS that subconsciously affect their achievement. Knowing that history dictates reality Teachers, especially in this COVID-19 era, must consider that history and recognize it when it affects students in our virtual or in our in-person interactions. Because we know history, we can respond accordingly. The many books and resources that I've shown you from premier scholars and researchers and all the wonderful work that you will put in as brilliant educators, we together will begin a new era in literacy for our most vulnerable students. I certainly hope that you take some of what I've said today into consideration. I thank you for your time and your attention. You can follow me and my educational musings on Instagram at Mrs. Pam I Am. I hope you all have a lovely rest of your pair fair. Bye.